Hi, my name is Rich, and today we're going to talk about the Rune Knight subclass for 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons, coming from the Tasha's Cauldron of Everything book. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the video. Currently, only 7.5% of viewers are subscribed, so if you'd like to help out the channel, it's free to hit the subscribe button, and you'll keep up to date with all of the Dungeons & Dragons subclass reviews and news. And if you'd like to buy me a coffee, there's a Patreon open at the moment. Links are in the description. Don't be afraid to drop by and see what's up. There's exclusive content published there every two weeks. This will include maps, random encounter tables, and a homebrew subclass in the future. The Rune Knight is a subclass that you can acquire at the third level of a fighter that lets you enhance your weapons and armor and other items with runes that hold great power. Let's read the description. Rune Knights enhance their martial prowess using the supernatural powers of runes, an ancient practice that originated with giants. Rune cutters can be found among any family of giants, and you likely learned your methods first or second hand from such a mystical artisan. Whether you found the giant's work carved into a hill or cave, learned of the runes from a sage, or met the giant in person, you studied the giant's craft and learned how to apply magical runes to empower your equipment. At third level, if you choose a subclass, you gain proficiency with the smith's tools and you learn to speak, read and write in the giant language. Also at level 3, you get the Rune Carver ability. You can use magic runes to enhance your gear. You learn two runes of your choice, and each time you gain a level in the class, you can replace one rune you know with a different one from this feature. When you reach certain levels in this class, you earn additional runes. At 7th level you get 3 runes, at 10th level you get 4 runes, and at 15th level you get access to 5 different runes. Whenever you finish a long rest, you can touch a number of objects equal to the number of runes you know, and you inscribe a different rune onto each of the objects. To be eligible, an object must be a weapon, a suit of armour, a shield, a piece of jewellery, or something else you can wear or hold in a hand. Your rune remains on an object until you finish a long rest, and an object can bear only one of your runes at a time. The following runes are available to you when you learn a rune. If a rune has a level requirement, you must be at least that level in the class to learn the rune. If a rune requires a saving throw, your rune magic save to EC equals 8, plus your proficiency bonus, plus your constitution modifier. So this is a good reason to pick a high constitution character when you're designing your fighter, if you have the rune knight in mind. Because of this tie to constitution, the goliath or the dwarf are great fits for the rune knight. Also, the half-orc gains additional constitution, and they have relentless endurance and savage attacks that perfectly complement the fighter subclasses. If you have Mythic Odysseus of Theros, you can pick the Leonins. The Leonin are nomadic, lion-like humanoids who rarely interact with other people. They have plus two constitution, plus one strength, dark vision, claws for unarmed combat damage, hunter's instinct, and daunting roar, which is a great feature to have at low levels. Additionally, it's worth checking out if you want to make a Gensai Rune Knight, because they're racial traits are plus two constitution, you also get the air, earth, fire and water sub-races, so that could complement the Rune Knight's selection of runes. Warforged also get plus two constitution, and are flexible with one other addition to an ability score. The first rune we're going to cover is the Cloud Rune. This rune emulates a deceptive magic used by some cloud giants. While wearing or carrying an object inscribed with the rune, you have advantage on dexterity sleight of hand checks and charisma deception checks. In addition, when you or a creature you can see within 30 feet of you is hit by an attack roll, you can use your reaction to invoke the rune and choose a different creature within 30 feet of you other than the attacker. The chosen creature becomes the target of the attack using the same rule. The magic can transfer the attack's effects regardless of the attack range. Once you invoke this rune, you can't do so again until you finish a short or long rest. This is quite similar to the Drunken Monk's abilities to be able to redirect incoming attacks at other enemies, and is a fantastic defensive tool. 
The fact that it recharges on a short rest is worth noting as well. Next up, we have the Fire Rune. This rune's magic channels the masterful craftsmanship of great smiths. While wearing or carrying an object inscribed with the rune, your proficiency bonus is doubled for any ability check you make that uses your proficiency with a tool. In addition, when you hit a creature with an attack using a weapon, you can invoke this rune to summon fiery shackles. The target takes an extra 2d6 fire damage and it must succeed on a strength saving throw or be restrained for one minute. While restrained by the shackles, the target takes an additional 2d6 fire damage at the start of each of its turns. The target can repeat the saving throw at the end of its turns, banishing the shackles on a success. Once you invoke this rune, you can't do so again until you finish a short or long rest. I think this plays to the fighter's strengths being able to deal additional damage and on bigger creatures the strength saving throw might not be the best option but if you're fighting against a spellcaster or something that's more agile then clamping this fire rune on them is a good way to continually damage them even if you don't manage to hit them in subsequent turns. Next up we have the frost rune. This rune's magic evokes the might of those who have survived in the wintry wilderness such as frost giants. While wearing or carrying an object inscribed with the rune, you have advantage on wisdom animal handling checks and charisma intimidation checks. In addition, you can invoke the rune as a bonus action to increase your sturdiness. For 10 minutes, you gain a plus two bonus to all ability checks and saving throws that use strength or constitution. Once you invoke this rune, you can't do so again until you finish a short or long rest. This frost rune is one of the more exploration and roleplay favored runes. It doesn't have a big impact on combat, unless you know that whatever you're facing will have some ability or an attack that can affect your strength or constitution. It's one of the weaker utility runes, but it still has its place in the right situation. Next up, we have the stone rune. This rune's magic channels the judiciousness associated with stone giants. While wearing or carrying an object inscribed with the rune, you have advantage on wisdom insight checks, and you have dark vision out to a range of 120 feet. In addition, when a creature you can see ends its turn within 30 feet of you, you can use your reaction to invoke the rune and force the creature to make a wisdom saving throw. Unless the save succeeds, the creature is charmed by you for one minute. While charmed this way, the creature has a speed of zero and is incapacitated, descending into a dreamy stupor. The creature repeats the saving throw at the end of each of its turns, ending the effect on a success. Once you invoke the rune, you can't do so again until you finish a short or long rest. Now this can be a very powerful rune. The ability to incapacitate one of your enemies is good in a stealthy situation, it's good when your party is facing a powerful foe, a powerful singular foe. But be wary that elves can't be charmed. If you're fighting against any elven creatures, then this rune is made redundant. That's all the options for the initial level 3 runes, but when you get to level 7 or higher, you can choose the hill rune. This rune's magic bestows a resilience reminiscent of a hill giant. While wearing or carrying an object that bears this rune, you have advantage on saving throws against being poisoned, and you have resistance against poison damage. In addition, you can invoke this rune as a bonus action gaining resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage for one minute. Once you invoke this rune, you can't do so again until you finish a short or long rest. This is a fantastic addition. Being able to be resistant to BPS damage is really powerful, especially when you're still on lower levels. If you're fighting a lot of creatures in the wild, then that, a lot of the damage you encounter is that way. But as you scale up to the higher levels, you'll find more necrotic, radiant or psychic damage from the creatures so it's very setting dependent as well make sure that the scenario you're in is appropriate if you want to choose the hill rune and finally when you hit level seven or higher you gain access to the storm rune using this rune you can glimpse into the future like a storm giant seer while wearing or carrying an object inscribed with the rune you have advantage on intelligence arcana checks and you can't be surprised as long as you aren't incapacitated. In addition, you can invoke the rune as a bonus action to enter prophetic state for one minute or until you're incapacitated. Until that state ends, when you or another creature you can see within 60 feet of you makes an attack roll, a saving throw, or an ability check, 
You can use your reaction to cause the rule to have advantage or disadvantage. Once you invoke this rune, you can't do so again until you finish a short or long rest. Being able to grant advantage or disadvantage as a reaction is incredibly powerful, and some may say it's slightly overpowered. It's almost like you're giving them bardic inspiration, but uh, at a much higher level. At third level, the Rune Knight gains Giant's Might. You have learned to imbue yourself with the might of giants. As a bonus action, you magically gain the following benefits, which last for one minute. If you are smaller than large, you become large, along with anything you're wearing. If you lack the room to become large, your size doesn't change. You have an advantage on strength checks and strength saving throws. Once on each of your turns, one of your attacks with a weapon or an unarmed strike can deal an extra 1d6 damage to the target on a hit. You can use this feature a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus, and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. So this is a long rest ability, you won't get it back on a short rest. But uh, to boost yourself up to a larger size is a great combination with characters that can deal extra damage with, the, with their unarmed melee attacks. For example, the Tabaxi or Leonin gain extra unarmed damage. And when you start gaining higher levels in Fighter, you start getting multiple attacks per turn. But bear in mind it's only once a turn, so don't think it applies to every attack you make. But if you get a crit, then... It works out pretty nice. At level 7, the Rune Knight gets access to Runic Shield. You learn to invoke your rune magic to protect your allies. When another creature you can see within 60 feet of you is hit by an attack roll, you can use your reaction to force the attacker to re-roll a d20 and use the new roll. You can use this feature a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus, and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. So this is another long rest ability. But uh, it's almost like a Uno Reverso No You card. <laughs> this can have great defensive potential when you're in the front line as a fighter and you're trying to defend the squishier targets. But bear in mind that the range is with 60 feet, so don't get too far away from the rest of your group. At level 10, you gain great stature. This ability uh, is quite humorous when combined with creatures like goblins or gnomes. The magic of your runes permanently alter you. When you gain this feature, roll 3d4 dice. You grow a number of inches in height equal to the roll. Moreover, the extra damage you do with your giant's might feature increases to 1d8. So just as a reminder, the giant's might is when you use a bonus action, you can become large and you deal an extra 1d6. So that's upgraded to 1d8, but it's still only once around, so keep that in mind. At level 15, you gain Master of Runes. With this ability, you can invoke each rune you know from your rune carver feature twice, rather than once. And you regain all expended uses when you finish a short or long rest. This basically doubles your potential uses of the runes. I think that it's a really good late level feature and helps keep the fighter balanced with other more late level balanced characters. And finally, at level 18, you get Runic Juggernaut. You learn how to amplify your rune-powered transformation. As a result, the extra damage you deal with the Giant's Might feature increases to 1d10. Moreover, when you use the feature, your size can increase to huge, and when you are that size, your reach increases by 5 feet. Getting the extra reach is an interesting feature, but increasing the damage from 1d8 to 1d10 isn't that much when you hit level 18. But as you're going through all your different runes, I'm sure you'll have a lot of abilities to tie up your actions and bonus actions and everything in between. All in all, I think this is a quite powerful fighter class. It gives you a lot of flexibility and it scales quite well. It's powerful at, at low level and quite powerful at high level as well. I'd have to give this a, a high A. It's not quite S tier, but it's uh, knocking on the door there. I think it's one of Fighter's greatest subclasses to pick. And it's up there with Battlemaster and Eldritch Knight in its uh, flexibility and raw damage output over time. So, what do you think of the ranking? 
Do you think it's as powerful as I've made it out to be? Did I make any mistakes in the video? Don't be afraid to point them out in the comments and I'll add them to the pinned comment so, so every point will be clarified. If you'd like to help support the channel, then subscribing helps and also leaving a like is free as well. If you want to support it monetarily, I have a Patreon open at the minute, linked in the description. And I'm also on Twitter, and we have a Discord open. If you'd like to join the Discord, there's a regular daily chat about all things D&D. Well, thanks for watching the video, and I'll speak to you later. Goodbye!